Hi, I'm David Holcomb, and I have the great honor of serving discipleship ministries here at the uh, Lord's Church at River Oaks Community Church. And uh, for the next few moments, it's a great privilege of mine to share with you something very exciting uh, that has been occurring uh, within the discipleship ministries uh, that we call the Journey Missional Discipleship. And um, this is what I'm going to share with you is what we share at our annual uh, orientation or information session. And so I'll be going through some of the slides, but we'll uh, really be available to answer any questions that you have outside of, of watching this video. Now, if you've been around River Oaks for uh, a few years, you know that we have uh, in place something we call our Vision 2025. And uh, it came about through years of prayer and intentional effort to develop the values and the objectives and the mission of the Lord's Church, His unique church, His gifting here at River Oaks Community Church. And uh, from that, uh, we have uh, what we found the seven values, Bible-centeredness and prayer-fueled and spirit-led, next-gen invested and so forth. And uh, when this was all taking place back in 2014, 2015, um, I had a, uh, a similar charge within discipleship to, to uh, really try to pray about and be led in what discipleship would look like in 2025. And so with that, uh, you know, it, it was difficult because the foundation of discipleship at River Oaks is very strong, uh, built around small group Bible study, uh, Bible teaching, uh, various, uh, you know, wow studies and faith, then fitness ministries, uh, one-off events and seminars. And so what would really be missing without just overloading and overwhelming uh, something that was already good? No need to, to reinvent the wheel, right? Well, what, what, uh, what we came to the conclusion about was that there is one uh, really uh, clear uh, concern and challenge with the global church uh, in our day, and that's the idea of biblical literacy. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to really address the idea of increasing the level of biblical literacy among our community, our congregation. And that's the learning, the loving, and the living out of Scripture. And so any discipleship vision, uh, any new ministry associated with discipleship needed to address biblical literacy. And so what might that look like? Well, that might look like that um, liter the biblical literacy aspect was emphasized, uh, that it was increased, that that was a result of growing deeper in whatever we did, that, the, uh, that it would be the fruit of the believers and the mark of a healthy church you know, uh, again, there's a very unique gifting uh, that uh, the Lord has led uh, individuals and families to River Oaks. But in our community, uh, would biblical literacy be something that River Oaks is, is known for, of building up uh, and prioritizing? And that it would be equal parts. Uh, when we talk about biblical literacy, we talk about the learning, and that is the theology. Uh, what does Scripture say about doctrine? Why do we believe what we believe? What's the context of Scripture or the insight? How do we memorize verses? The loving. How do we thirst? Do we desire? When we aren't in the Word, do we miss it? Do we truly need it? Is it our daily bread? Uh, do we see the beauty of it, the literary styling of it, the reverence of God's Word? And then finally, are we living it out? Uh, the application. Uh, are our ethics and our world views, are they, are they grounded in the idea of God's Word, and are we obeying it and applying it? Uh, I often talk about the biblical literacy uh, being uh, as if a tripod, uh, that really the need is that all three legs, the learning, the loving, and the living out, are necessary to grow and to be pursued uh, with uh, equal parts passion uh, and, uh, and obedience. And so that's really the idea of what biblical literacy is, and what any uh, discipleship vision uh, would, uh, would include. And so what was our roadmap to reach this reality? Well, there was some general criteria. Any discipleship ministry um, that, that uh, really focused or targeted biblical literacy, it would be a matter of quality over quantity. Uh, it would be intentional. Uh, it wouldn't just be, well, the more we do, surely the more literate we'll be with God's Word. No, no, no. It needed to be something that was engaging and life-changing. Uh, did it align with our current values uh, that we've mentioned prior, those seven? Uh, did it have a high level of commitment? You know, um, the issue with biblical literacy today that many scholars and theologians and pastors will observe is that uh, if you ask everyone on a Sunday morning, um, who believes biblical literacy is a good thing, that we should all be biblical literate, um, all the hands go up. But when you ask, 
well, who really wants to work uh, in the discipline of growing and maturing in biblical literacy? Most of the hands come down. And so uh, we're looking for a level of commitment that is, um, that is significant, that the view is worth the climb, uh, that it would be core to our current discipleship hub, uh, that it would be a shared space with small groups. Small groups would not go anywhere. Our current Bible studies would not go anywhere, but uh, this new discipleship vision and ministry would, would sort of be central, though. They would come alongside and be, be, uh, be core to who we are. Uh, and then finally, it, it would be holistic growth, uh, that uh, it would address things from Scripture and doctrine, as we mentioned, theology, but the relationships as well. Uh, how do we live out God's Word in our homes, in our marriages, in our friendships, in our children, our parenting, uh, culture and worldview? How do we address the questions of science? How do we address the questions of culture? Uh, and spiritual formation, spiritual disciplines, evangelism. So holistically, what is it that would move us to greater maturity within discipleship? And this was really our objective. How do we find that? And so we started to receive input, made observations, several benchmark visits and trips. Uh, what are churches that are growing deeper and not simply wider? Uh, what are they doing right? What are those best practices? Reeser made many visits. And ultimately, in late 2015, uh, just a great consensus of the spirit and the input and the observations. Uh, we landed on a process that Randy Pope, who was a senior pastor at Perimeter Church in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, that he had developed some 20, 25 years ago. Uh, very similar to, in, in a way to River Oaks. Uh, Randy Pope had uh, been a church plant of some 30 families in his home and had since grown to uh, many, many members who were truly impacting the community. And uh, what he recognized was in the early days, he was pursuing growth from a numbers, uh, a numbers perspective. And the Lord convicted of him, uh, him of that very early. And he started to really focus in on the idea that it was the critical few. And it was building up the depth in the church, the idea of being biblically literate. And because of that, th the church would grow. And it has significantly. And so many, many have gone through this process that, that he would call missional discipleship, life on life, missional discipleship, and would be part of this journey process. Uh, there's a quote by Tim Keller that talks about uh, Mr. Pope being one of the pastors who's, uh, you know, he doesn't know anyone more personally fruitful in discipleship ministry than, than Randy Pope. And uh, the church leader who's, who's had a more sustained, lifelong commitment to making the ministry of discipleship a pervasive force throughout his whole church. And uh, that's, that's where we landed, and we knew there was something there. And so that was uh, really affirmed when we understood our vision aligned with that vision of missional discipleship and journey groups, that it really is about laboring in the lives of a few with the intention of imparting our lives, God's Word, the Gospel, in such a way to see one another become mature and equipped followers of Jesus, committed to doing the same in the lives of others. And that this cycle would continue on, that we would grow and invest in one another, and then we would be sent to grow and invest in the lives of others. And really, the alignment for us came uh, as Colossians 1, 28, 29. Uh, if you've been in a new members class or you've been in any discipleship classes, you know that this is really the heart uh, of our discipleship ministries. This is the verse that uh, I believe speaks well to what is going on and what what should be our focus? That Jesus is who we proclaim, that we are in the, in the work of warning and teaching and encouraging and holding uh, each other accountable in all of the wisdom that God's Word provides us, that the Spirit leads us in, that we may present. Why? That we may present everyone mature in Christ. Wherever we may be, tomorrow we will be that much more mature in Christ than we were yesterday. And for that, I and you and all of us toil, we struggle uh, with great effort with the energy that he, he powerfully provides within us. And so that's what, that's what really resonated with us relative to what goes on in journey groups and missional discipleship. And so um, that's the journey that led us to journey. Uh, the second 
part of what I'd like to share of um, really three things that I wanted to share with you, the, the journey and then what is journey, and then finally, is journey right for you? But the second part is, okay, what is it? Uh, and so we had a focus group, we had an ignition team that, that went through it and uh, discovered what it was, and really, plain and simply, this is, this is what it is. It is a curriculum guided uh, process, ministry. It is three years of curriculum material that is guided by topics and subjects, 28 weeks a year, basically following a school calendar. They are gender-specific groups between three and six members. In our, in our first few years, we've had groups with, with three members. We've had groups with uh, six. We've had a seven-member group. So a general consensus, but gender-specific is very key. Um, we ask for a covenant of one-year commitment that when uh, we say we want to go through journey that we are going to be faithful for that one year. We desire that we would go through all three, but we're not going to ask that of anybody. That's, that's quite a commitment, but it's a one-year commitment to, to hopefully there's a desiring to continue with it and an ability to. And weekly, there's content that uh, you walk through in the material that is really structured in these five areas. Uh, and that's really the idea that we're going to spend time in the truth. Whatever that subject or that topic is for the week, there are, there's going to be scripture relevant to that topic or structure. Uh, that's the scripture. There's going to be time in equipping. Now, what do we do with it? God's, God has revealed His character. He has revealed uh, our response. Now, how do we respond? What's the application? There is accountability each week, both personally and within a conversation with your group members. Uh, and then there's a mission aspect. And this is, this is unique from most groups. This is not so much about being on mission as in serving the community or uh, you know, working at a food pantry or a shelter or anything like that. This is about the relational aspect of sharing the gospel and sharing one's life. Who is it that God has placed in your life, in my life, in the life of other journey members in our group uh, that we're going to pray over for a group that uh, we are going to look for opportunities to have conversations, that we are going to invest time in to be relational and ultimately pray for that moment to answer questions and share, share the gospel. We're going through journey in order to, to be more confident in our answers, uh, to be able to speak to these aspects of scripture and, and biblical worldview so that we are ready uh, that we're always prepared to give an answer for anyone who asks us about the hope that we have. And then finally, there's the aspect of supplication each week, and that's the time of prayer. Now, many groups will get together after they've been through these, these uh, units for the week and doing them themselves, and uh, they'll go through them in order. Hey, guys, what did you feel about the truth this week? What was stuck out to you? Uh, look at this passage in Proverbs. I've never seen that before. Uh, well, how do we apply it now? What did you do different? Uh, some will uh, start with supplication and may spend most of their time in supplication for the week. Uh, each group's a little bit different, but we'll get to that. But this is the basics of what journey is uh, as the curriculum aspect. And then finally, there are three sets of curriculum. There's the green year, the blue year, and the red year. And regardless of when you join the journey, each September, when we have new groups and new members, whatever year we are in, that becomes your year. It's beautiful the way that works. If you're in year one and you're a blue, I may be in year three in a blue, and that's okay. Uh, it doesn't build on each other. It simply picks up and enhances the prior years. And so uh, whichever year we're in is, is the year we spend time in. But every year has these six units. We always begin the year with six weeks on gospel living, uh, understanding that missing yearning, that, sp that space of glory that we so need that was taken from us at the fall and how God's grace can help replace it. And that becomes how we really start to, to, to understand um, our mission, the missional discipleship aspect of sharing that. And then we walk through grace commitments, uh, knowing God, in one year, it may be three weeks on the Trinity. On another year, it may be three weeks on the, the I call it the shuns. Uh, what is regeneration and uh, what is sanctification and what is glorification? Not that we have to be able to spout out the definition and teach to them, but um, in, in common language and what the scripture says, those are important aspects of, of what happens to us when we're transformed. 
Let's understand them. Uh, the sacraments. Uh, what goes on in baptism? Um, that may be someone, someone unchurched or an unbeliever may approach you and say, hey, I've got a friend, they say they do baptism this way and you do it this way. Um, that's why I never really give much thought because it, it just seems so different. Explain that to me. How do you explain it to them? Well, let's learn that. Let's talk about that. Every year there's a unit on marriages, which is really about relationships and whether you're married or not, uh, whether one day you will be married or not, uh, whether uh, you are investing in the relationships of others, uh, maybe your children or your neighbors or uh, your family members, uh, there are aspects of that that are important to all of us. Biblical worldview is always fascinating. Seven weeks, one year, there's, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on science, evolution, that sort of aspect. How do we speak to that? What do we know about that? Creation, how do we understand it? Um, one year there's on suffering. It's one of the greatest questions that we get. Why would a God allow this much suffering? Well, let's look at the biblical worldview of that and be able to speak to it. And then finally, we always end the year with uh, a section on parenting. And once again, whether you're a parent or not, will be a parent or not, uh, we are a church that invests in the next generation. So how do we build up um, children, young adults, a next generation. How do we how do we help others parent our neighbors, our family, um, those around us in our community? So it's important for all of us, and we all get something out of each one of these units. And I I know you can't I know you can't read that necessarily, but that's the table of contents uh, in the green year, and it really is just there to point out that. Uh, there are those six units, and within each of them, they spell out exactly what the topic is for that week. And so I look at uh, this green year, and I look at the grace commitments, and, and there's the idea of um, generous living uh, and our contentment, our investments, our motives for worship, our demonstration of faith. Um, and, of course, um, those first six weeks stay the same. And you can find this table of context at... Um, a, uh, the, the, we, we list the website as well uh, on Journey. I think it's Missional Discipleship or lifeonlife.org. Uh, and we can provide you and you can kind of get an idea of what that is as well. But there's a blue year and um, you could pause that, I guess, now and take a look as well. Uh, and a red year. And that's the three-year curriculum uh, that we move through in, in Journey. And after we finish that third year, um, the desire... And what Randy has found in his church for the past 25 to 30 years uh, is that um, you complete the three years and at least half, at least half of those members will go on to begin their own journey groups. At one point he, had, he was working on his eighth or ninth season of journey. And I think that's just a tremendous testimony uh, to the power of investing in the lives of others uh, in order that they may also invest in the lives of others. And so there are weekly resources involved uh, that are optional as well. There's the, the actual manual, which is important. It's electronic as well. We can uh, help you get one of those. Uh, there's a leader guide, but uh, unlike small groups, and I'll explain this in a moment, uh, leader is a term that's not used in its traditional sense. We'll explain that. There's a book called The Answer, which is always used during the first six weeks of the Gospel Living. And, uh, and grace, tremendous explanation of what's going on uh, on, our, uh, on, on the fall of man and God's plan of reconciliation, redemptive history. Uh, short book that's really helpful, and you may do a chapter a week or something like that. There are various life issue books along the way, weekly MP3s, and there's uh, available content that's part of uh, the, the book and, and being a member uh, that you can actually go and uh, straight from Randy Pope uh, get five or six minutes of what's going on in his mind that week for the topic and the subject at hand in that particular year. And we have tried to align ourselves with Perimeter Church so that when we're in the green year, they're in the green year. And uh, this makes uh, a lot of sense as well. Um, now, all of that said, some of us have heard uh, what I've said so far and said, oh, goodness, this sounds like coursework. Is this seminary? Uh, is this, uh, uh, am I getting a certificate? Uh, no, this is the most important caveat of the entire conversation, perhaps. Journey is not a curriculum-driven program, okay? Uh, this is not about checking a list and getting through assignments. Uh, this is a, a process 
for which uh, the curriculum guides us. Uh, it is, is used to initiate those, those relationship dynamics, uh, spiritual growth, uh, to help guide our, our uh, review and our understanding and interpretation of God's truth and to transform us and, to, and, and really enable us in uh, growth as far as biblical literacy is concerned. Uh, some group meetings may or may not cover much of the weekly activity. That is something we are uh, doing personally and we bring it together and have a conversation about it. Some weeks we may camp out in the truth and never make it to equipping or, or accountability. And some weeks we may start with prayer and spend half our time in prayer. Okay, so uh, it's a unique, unique process, um, but it's, it's been very helpful to be structured in that way, and we've been very careful to keep it that way as well. And um, so that's really important. And so our vision is affirmed by, by what you saw of what journey is and, um, and understand what, what journey is. And um, when we came to that affirmation, 2016, we followed their, uh, their perimeter church's advice in this manner too. Uh, over and over and over, the emphasis and the recommendation was to think big, start small, and go deep. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, we had an ignition team in the spring of 2017, two, two groups, one group of men, one group of ladies from a broad variety uh, of our church and um, ages and seasons and stages of life. And there were groups, three groups, two groups of seven each for this ignition team. Walked through 12 weeks and uh, of what journey would be like. Again, just to, just to ensure uh, that we were on the right track. And uh, at the end of those 12 weeks, to the person, all 14 said, yes, we, we really need to implement Journey at River Oaks. This would, this would be very fruitful, it would be edifying, uh, it would be fulfilling, and it would honor God. And so from that, starting small, we don't broadcast it. We allow divine interactions. Um, I took a group of men, Pastor Beatty took a group of men, and then we had two ladies groups started. And so we had 22 members in that first year. We added four more groups in the second year, 37 members. In the third year, we added three more groups, 54 members. And this, again, is getting toward part of that discipleship vision. How do we change lives and are, are used to help change lives from the Spirit? Um, year four, the vision is that many of those year one members will have now gone through the curriculum and we're beginning new groups and we begin our first of the church-wide orientation sessions and information sessions. Unlike small groups, this is not a place that we just say, hey, sign up. Um, we, we really want you to understand what it is and understand what's going on. And so we began these church-wide information sessions and uh, really are just, just relying on the Lord to move in this way, according to His will, and if it were His will, not at all a matter of, of the numbers, but the possibility and the potential that as we walk through these years, uh, in, in year 10, with just a very conservative 50% of those leaders continuing to invest in the lives of others, it could be 500 individuals that are, that are joined together, um, sort of a hand in hand through the idea of journey and investing in the lives of others. And that's what's transformational to a community. And so that's the thinking big. That was the starting small. And uh, also I think you get a little idea of what the going deep is. And so the last part of this conversation, thank you for staying with us uh, to this point. It's very exciting for me. Uh, the last part of this is journey for you. And there's a couple of checks that you can, you can really ask yourself. Of course, you can pray over it, but really, I think you really need to understand a couple more things. One is, this is a different sandbox than small groups, life groups, home groups, traditional groups that we are familiar with. And what I mean by that, I talk about it as sandboxes, but really what I mean by that is that if we think about the spiritual formation pathway that we all begin, we are born into a life of unbelief. And at some point, some point along the way, praise God, um, we, we come to an understanding uh, that Jesus is Lord. He is God's Son. He was raised from the dead. He was brought back to life, and we confess Him as Lord and Savior, and we have moved into an, a time of belief. Well, 
we are to grow in that Colossians 1, 28, 29. And we move toward maturity to the last of our dying breaths. We're moving more and more closer to Christ-likeness. And that's typically, if you, if you survey the traditional small group, that's really where 95% of the members w- 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 will fall. That it could be a, a, a neighbor, someone new to church that has not confessed Jesus as Lord. Come on to small group. We'd love to fellowship with you. We'd love to build those relationships and introduce you uh, to, to, to God's Word and to others and the lives of others, to live life together. And so we, we have those who are believers, and then we are progressing to maturity. But see, what happens with journey is the sandbox of journey really begins with believers. Whether that's someone who has confessed Jesus as Lord last week and is a new believer in Christ, or someone who's been walking with the Lord for 50 years. That's the starting point. And moving us to that same place of maturity, but beyond. And beyond is the idea of spiritual leadership that says, I want to be someone who not only moves to maturity myself, I want to help others move to maturity. I want to obey the plan A that Jesus had for His disciples, that we are to go and make disciples, that we are to teach all that He has instructed, His Word, to be biblically literate, and uh, to move others to these places of maturity. And that's what spiritual leadership is. It's not church offices. This isn't a a matter of, hey, spiritual leadership is, well, I might become a deacon or an elder or a pastor. This is the spiritual leadership that exists in your home, in your school, in, in your workplace, in your neighborhood with your family, with your children? Am I seeking, are my, are my antennas up every day, intentionally seeking, intentionally listening for opportunities to move others to maturity? That's what spiritual leadership is. That's the aim of journey. And so those are the two, small, the two sandboxes uh, that, we, that we sort of uh, move into if we're in a small group or a journey group. Coexisting, both are necessary vital to the health of the church and to the advancement of of God's kingdom. But they're different. They are unique in this way. So um, maybe that's a a realization that's um, to consider. Uh, And uh, maybe that's something that you were or were not expecting. Also, there's five attributes of a journey member that I think are are very critical that um, Perimeter found, again, over 25, 30 years, were the difference between someone who would be successful in in fulfilling the journey uh, the journey uh, and someone who would possibly not be successful in this. The first is that there's someone who is faithful. Now that's faithful in their worship, faithful in, in, in being in community, and what I mean by that is if you're someone who is who has struggled to be consistent in worship, to be consistent maybe in your small group, to be consistent uh, and um, you know uh, over time in your service or your or your prayer time or your or your study time. Not that there are seasons uh, and uh, voids in our life. Not that we struggle or there are challenges. But if if our life to this state in Christ has been uh, more or less unfaithful, journey is not the time to begin. Okay. Um, Faithful, someone who is faithful is going to become a journey member. Okay? Otherwise, there are other ways to become more faithful and grow into that. But faithfulness is very important because it's going to be so vital to the health of that group. Secondly, someone who's available. This again, this may not be the season because you know you're going to be traveling for work the next six months. Or you just gave birth to triplets. Whatever it might be, uh, you may not be available. So um, we'll be here next year this time. But really, check your heart. Know the difference between the priorities of your life and 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 the needs and necessities of your life and what those schedules allow and don't allow. And really check that availability. Because we we really want, want individuals who are available as well. It's very important. Interdependency. Meaning, uh, there is no I in journey. Okay, uh, I guess there's an O U R. So it's our group. It's it's we. It's us. It's not I. There are no Lone Ranger uh, Christians in journey groups, and so that's why the traditional leadership is really more who is assigned 
the, the primary conduit for me to communicate to the group. Uh, but once you get into the group, uh, you're each leaders. Unlike small groups where a leader may come more prepared in most weeks or uh, have a, uh, an understanding of greater facilitation to the group, in journey groups what ultimately happens is that each member uh, may take a week, may say, hey, I'm facilitating next week, you're facilitating the week after. Can we give up that facilitation? Are we, are we good at listening uh, for five-sixths of the time and only speaking one-sixth of the time? That's interdependency, vital to the health of a journey group. Are we teachable? Are we open to the Holy Spirit's teaching? On the essentials, do we know why we're convicted uh, of those essentials? And can we speak to them? Can we be taught on how to better scripturally and biblically explain them? And on the non-essentials, are we opening to listening to others, to the Spirit first, but to others? Are we teachable? Um, mold us, shape us, Lord. Allow others around us to teach us. Been walking with Jesus for 40 years. Um, there's so much we need to learn and we need to be shown. So let's be teachable. And then finally, double asterisk. Uh, journey is for individuals who are hungry. In those early years, uh, journey was not covert. It was just not publicized. And what we found were those initial groups when we were uh, really just starting small, uh, were made up of, comprised of members who had approached us, approached me and said, hey, I'm really hungry for something that takes me deeper in God's Word. What else can I do? And we said, ah, I've got something for you. It's journey. And so what are, the, what are those individuals in your life? Who are those individuals? Are you one who says, I really desire this. I'm hungry to know God's Word, to learn it, to love it, and to live it out. Do I have that desire? Now, your availability may be a little bit spotty. We like 80% available as sort of like a, a you know, threshold um, check of our time. But if you're really hungry and you can be there 75% of the time and continue to make efforts to be engaged, um, that's okay too. Hunger, hunger for God's Word um, really drives all the other aspects as well. So does that describe you? Are you faithful? Um, are you ready for journey? So use that as, as an opportunity to consider uh, your, your, uh, your place in journey. And really, what is the next step? Well, fall of the season. Uh, what we do is we have our, our information session. We begin to form new groups. Um, we ask you to pray about it. Spend some time considering it. Think about all that we've talked about it. Research it a little bit. Discuss it with others. Uh, discuss it with your spouse, perhaps. Uh, maybe your spouse is interested. Discuss it with some friends. Maybe there's someone in your small group that you think, gosh, I don't know if they know about this, but the three or four of us, we might could become a journey group. Discuss it. Discuss it with me. Divine encounters. Antennas up. Radar up. Um, I've, heard, I've heard Joe say three or four times now his desire for something like that. Let me explore that. Lord, maybe you're leading me to this in, in certain ways around other individuals uh, that you've placed in my life that I'm just now seeing why. Uh, seek that out. Look for that. That may be the core to a group that you're going to begin. And then let me know. Um, email me. Call me here at the church. Uh, I am David Holcomb, one word, at riveroakschurch.org. You can call the church office. You can stop me on a Sunday morning outside the Resource Center. But let me know. Let me know, A, uh, I'd like to be in a group. I don't really have anyone else around me. Can you place me in an existing group or one that you're forming? Yes, we'll work, we will work tirelessly to place you. Or two, hey, there's four of us, and um, we would like to be a journey group. Let me know. We'll start getting you the materials and we'll start talking to you about the process of beginning, usually in mid-September, uh, plus or minus oh, a week or two. And again, each group's different. Some groups go straight through and they go from set Labor Day, they're, they're usually wrap up in mid-April. Some groups begin in mid-September, uh, they take a few weeks off Christmas or Easter or have other breaks or they have a rule in their group, a standing rule that says uh, when more than half the group is all gone. We're going to postpone this week till the next week, and they may conclude in uh, late June. It's okay. 
uh, however that works for your group. But usually September is the start, is when we begin a new color year. And then lastly, thank you again for, for hanging with us right now, but lastly, frequently asked questions. Can I participate in small group and journey groups? Yes, absolutely. We have many who uh, one spouse will be in a journey group, the other spouse will be in a, you know, a men's group and a women's group, and they use small group as their time to fellowship together. I would ask you if you're a leader of a small group to please have a conversation with me first. It might be time to transition that leadership to someone else in your group. It is very difficult to do small groups leadership and participate in a journey group. So that, that would be my advice or recommendation. Typical group schedules, uh, most groups meet weekly, about 90 minutes. Some of them take advantage of the childcare on Sunday afternoons uh, or Wednesday nights. Uh, some meet in the mornings, some meet during the day or late at night, any night of the week. Uh, so there really is just sort of that weekly expectation, but uh, each group is different as well. Preferred meeting locations. The preferred meeting location, again, based on experience, is the church uh, part of the discipleship uh, building when uh, it was first proposed and justified and uh, prayed over was the opportunity to invest in journey groups we have several rooms that are set up for six to eight individuals uh, specifically for journey um, and having that central place to focus on the truth and the equipping and the accountability and so forth for the week is very important second preferred location is, uh, is one of the members' homes that could rotate or that could just simply be a central location. Um, the third preferred location uh, is there is no preferred number three. Journey is not typically um, successful or really getting everything you can get out of it if you say, hey guys, let's meet at Panera or you know, let's, uh, let's grab something at Dario and, and have our journey conversation. Maybe a once in a while sort of thing, but uh, really, uh, it's, it's a, more, a little more focused time because we want some conversations to go deep. It's why there are gender specific groups. What we found and what Perimeter found is that men tend to be more transparent around other men. Ladies tend to be more transparent around the other ladies. We also find, much like small groups, when a couple uh, attends together, one or the other will sometimes be a little bit more uh, involved or engaged in the conversation than the other and sometimes be much more um, faithful in their attendance. Uh, you take it this week, I'll take it next week. And so many reasons uh, that they're gender specific, but that's also part of the reasons why meeting at church or meeting at home is important as well. This is a little bit different. Again, remember invited members, if you're thinking, hey, I've got a group, I'd like to invite someone to be, my, to be in that group. The starting point is to be a believer, someone who is new, not very mature, fantastic. Invite them, a lot of questions. I know that Jesus died for me. I know that he is Lord, that's all I know. Great, journey's gonna be awesome for you. Or I've been walking 50 years and there's so much more I need to know, great. Journey's gonna be great for you. Desire discipleship and disciple making. That's really uh, the, the aspect of that hunger to be committed, available 80% of the time, like we talked about in the one-year commitment. That's really River Oaks Journey. That's what journey is all about. And those are the decision points and the opportunities for you to consider if journey is right for you. I would love, it would, it would be wonderful, there's some of my favorite conversations, to speak to you more about uh, the way journey or what's called also missional discipleship um, works or how it might work with you, uh, please again have that conversation and um, until then uh, I just want to pray this time out and thank you so much for uh, your interest and, um, and, for, and for watching and spending some time with us around this really important and exciting subject. Let me pray for us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, Lord that you allow us the great privilege to be in your word, that you so inspired it and you so preserved it and that you are so revealed through it that we see your character and we see, Lord, in that what our response to that should be. Help us continue to dig deep in that, Lord. May we not be um, a follower um, 
that is shallow in the idea of learning and loving and living out your word. May we be one who is deep and desiring it and hungry for it so that your light may shine through us, so that we are prepared and we are ready for those moments that you lead us into every single day. Lord, we thank you for those who have gone before and we thank you for those hearts that are listening and that you're preparing now uh, to begin this journey. May you give them great certainty about it. May you affirm that in them. And may you, uh, Lord, just continue to strengthen us uh, with that passion for knowing you better, loving you more, serving you and serving others. And we ask all of this in your wonderful name. Amen. Thank you.